Good day class. So for today's third lecture, we look at organization and the structure of the banking and financial industry. Essentially, just like every other business sector, banking and the financial industry has responded to change. So whether it's technological change or it's change uh, in terms of the structure of business today, or it's change that is motivated by geopolitics, banks, financial institutions, they've all responded to that change. On today's lecture agenda, we look at the array of organization structures in banking, the financial holding company, merged and acquisitions in banking, and changes in structure of competitors and the impact an impact on internal changes. So not only are those changes uh, external to the company, but we've also been seeing those changes that are happening internally. So internally, the, the banks are rearranging the way they work so that they can be, as we say in today's uh, business world, agile and become more resilient to shocks and so forth. So it's not only their external structure that is being changed, but it's their internal arrangements um, that are also changing. In the previous uh, two lectures, we explored many of the roles and services that the modern bank and financial institutions and their competitors uh, provide. Right? Of course, with the passing of time, bankers and the managers of financial of competing financial institutions have been have evolved into different forms. Right. So many have well, you've seen a back and forth between structures that are tall and are vested in various level of hierarchies, and we've also seen uh, structures that have, been, have become flat. So there have been that back and forth between structures just to respond to the external shocks and um, respond to, and, and those responses are all aimed to be to ensure that the banks or those financial institutions have, uh, are competitive. What we've also seen is an array of a wide array of mergers between financial institutions, and many of these financial institutions have now become even more uh, transnational, right? So they exist in several jurisdictions, so so that they can uh, derive whatever benefits or synergies that are out there. Right? Since so the financial institution role and size are not the only determinants of how it is organized or how well it is organized, right? So it's not only their role and their size will determine uh, how they're organized or how well they perform, but it's their other ingredients in the way they do business that will determine how well um, these banks perform. So how well do they embrace technologies, right? How responsive is their management or the culture of the bank to changes? What kind of orientation and disposition does management and its employees have? Do, they, do they, for instance, embrace a learning orientation, which uh, puts them in a better place to adopt, uh, to be early adopters of technologies, right? In particular, in particular in this world today, essentially technology is driving lots of the gains that companies are getting. How well they perform uh, will depend on other things such as being able to you know, lobby governments to ensure that they have, well, among the other things, to lobby governments to ensure that they have uh, those economic or those conditions that best, best suit their particular business model, right? Uh, secondly, it's how well uh, they can have those various legislations to protect uh, any competition from any external competition. If we go back to our particular scenario here in Guyana, where you had uh, several institutions but uh, trying to acquire Scotia Bank, and you will see later in this in this uh, presentation why it was important for the government or to the regulators um, who act on behalf of the government 
to block those uh, potential takeovers um, of Scotia Bank. And it is those things that will determine, right, that there's no dominant play in the market and gives the, give the other financial institutions a fair um, ground to play on so that their performance could be um, up to par, up to scratch what their shareholders are demanding. Right? Further, we will discuss the factors impacting the changes of, in, of structure, size, and the types of organization dominating the financial services industry today. The organization structure of the commercial banking industry. Again, just to remind you that most of what we, in this course, we will use the US as the benchmark, uh, being a first world developed and a developed country. And then we will try to uh, compare that with our economy, Ghana, an emerging economy. So advancing size and concentration of assets. <clears throat> All right, so one of the things that we've seen is uh, these financial institutions are growing really large, or these commercial banks in particular growing really large, and there's a concentration of their assets in, into, into particular spaces, jurisdiction, uh, particular industry that they serve, right? So here we have commercial banking is the dominant supply of credit and payments services to businesses and household, of course, right? Uh, they still hold that despite the competition that they get from other financial uh, services company for instance the insurance companies uh, those credit unions though they continue to grow in size uh, the banks the commercial banks continue to outgrow them and still hold that dominant position as the provider of uh, credit and payment services both to households and the banks <clears throat> many banks in the u.s are small but by global standards uh, right so in addition to knowing about the city bank and the uh, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Wells Fargo. There are many other small banks that are that focus on particular states, um, particular uh, communities, several, and they serve an important role because then they they serve those small areas that larger banks would not find profitable to do, and they uh, essentially. Those banks essentially, despite you know being um, small, they are still able to be profitable because they have structured the business in a way that will um, better ensure their survival in those small markets. Right? In contrast, uh, the American banking industry also contains some of the largest financial institutions, some of which I've just mentioned to you. Um, in addition to those that I've mentioned, I should should have mentioned J.P. Morgan as one of the um, one of the largest financial institution worldwide. Right. So what we see is banking continues to be increasingly concentrated not only in the smallest, but also in the very largest of all financial firms. So you see, so essentially what you have, you have uh, these two con uh, the continuum from smallest to largest, you have concentrations in those two ends, while the middle um, tends to be a little more uh, thin off, as we see. The internal organizations of the banking firm, right? So we see, what we see is that great difference in size have appeared in recent years, right? And this has led to a marked difference in the way banks and other financial service providers are organized internally, right? And this has led to a variety of financial uh, variety of financial services each institution sells in the market it chooses to serve. Right. So as a result of the variant sizes that we've seen in the banking sector, financial services sector, most of these firms have decided that they will only concentrate on a few products. Some of these companies of uh, firms have decided that they will only exist in a particular way. So that hence you have things such as e-banking. Uh, so this is where banks have no physical structure, but it's strictly aided by the technology of today. So, and of course, many of the current generation trust technology so much, so they find it very convenient and um, just to do online banking. So of course, with that, uh, dealing with e-banks, of course, it takes away 
that personal touch that you might develop or that re personal relationship that you will develop with a particular employee at a bank. But for them, of, the of those of the current generation, it is the convenience and speed that matters to them more than actually developing those relationships, right? So as a result of all of these things that we've seen, uh, particularly in Boazongto, we've seen great difference in size, sizes in banks over the years. And as a result of that, you see that these banks have chosen to uh, provide particular services in particular jurisdiction so that they have that particular niche that they concentrate on, which uh, better enables their survival. We've seen community banks and other community-oriented financial firms, right? So <clears throat> we must bear in mind that when we speak of community, it's it's rather relevant. If we speak about a community in Ghana, then we're speaking of, you know, maybe a uh, Charles Tong or a work in Russ or a Queen's Tongue, where you have, you know, a couple hundred people or maybe a thousand, 1,500 people at the most. But communities in North America can be very large and some can run up to, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands, right? So it will make sense for banks to just focus on one particular area. So you will have uh, communities that run you, you know, 200,000, 250,000. So it's all relative when we speak about communities, right? And what we've seen as a result of these uh, community banks and other community-oriented financial firms, you've seen devoted principally to the markets for smaller locally-based deposits and loans and are often referred to as retail banks, right? In Guyana, we see some of that. Uh, well, we see some of the well, we see some of the large banks in Guyana have gone into particular areas to serve those communities. And essentially, the driver behind that is the economic activity. Of course, you'll see most of the banks um, in Guyana, you, you'll always find a presence in places of particle. That is known for, you know, gold miners coming there and, um, you know, carry on lots of businesses, uh, lots of business. So it becomes, it makes sense for them to, to or those banks to serve those communities. If you look at Perico, which is busy commercially with farmers in the market and so forth on particular days of the week. Banks have found it profitable to open the branch there to service um, um, those customers that come to that Parika area. And because of those, I guess, the quantum of economic activity that goes on there, right? So in Guyana, we've also focused on that community and going to certain communities, right? If you go to Burbies, then you have Rosal. And if you've ever gone to Rosal, then you'll know that Arga New Amsterdam, R Rosal is probably the next busiest on the on the quarantine, and then you have to go till up to um, maybe maybe uh, Skeldon before it gets a lot busier, right? So, and all of those areas um, have what we would call in Guyana branches, but in the U.S. of course we call them community banks, right? Financial firms of this type stand in sharp contrast to the wholesale banks and essentially wholesale banks. So we have the retail banks focus on more deposits and loans. Wholesale banks, we will we will touch on that and explain exactly what those banks, um, the services those banks provide. Then you have what happens between what happens in these communities banks or these branches as we call them in Guyana is that you have the building of, of, of real relationships, strong relationships between the managers of those banks that lie in those communities or in, in, in the case of Guyana, uh, in those townships, right? Uh, Skelton is not a town, but so, so, so is Rosal and um, New Amsterdam, of course, and Bartica, those are towns. But what you have um, is that building of that close relationship between the customer and manager, so they so they can have that real personalized service that could um, certainly be uh, mutually beneficial both to the bank and to that particular customer. Right? Community banks are usually uh, significantly significantly impacted by changes in the health of the local community and keeping up with new regulations. Of course, uh, if economic activity decreases, then you might see bank vanishing. Right? If we Typical example to take in, in the case of Guyana, 
uh, there was a time that Linden had, um, you know, GNCB, which is probably the biggest bank um, for a while. But of course, this box site disappeared. Then, of course, uh, the economic activity slowed in Linden and it forced um, particularly uh, the GNCB bank to fold and close. Um, of course, they had several bad loans on their bank, which, you know, speeded up their close. But you would not find all the commercial banks uh, present in Linden these days, just because our branches of um, those commercial banks present in Linden these days, just because, um, you know, the economic activity isn't as it used to be in the 70s and the 80s, right? Um, of course, these institutions have been losing ground, both in numbers of institution and industry shares. Right. In the U.S., because of increased competition, then you see uh, these small banks, uh, community banks have been losing their market share and, um, you know, and they've been losing their market share, you know, because of one, you're seeing more institutions opening up in those communities. Right? And of course, mergers and acquisitions. Some of the bigger banks now find that they found some of those smaller community banks to be profitable and they've added those banks to their portfolio. Right. So the organization chart of a small community bank, and again, this goes um, to the US, which is just to give you an idea of what their um, organizational chart looks like. So you have a chief administrative officer, including the board or offices, including the board of direct the board chairman and the and president or CEO. Then you have these various divisions. So you have a lending division, accounting and operations division, fundraising and marketing division, and then you have a trust division. And all those divisions have performed particular tasks. So for example, the lending so for example, the lending division has a commercial loans officer, customer loan officer, compliance officer. Right, so one ensure, compliance officer ensures that you, you know the bank is in uh, following the rules, the laws and regulation of the country or a particular state if it's the US. Uh, of course, consumer loans will look at uh, the ordinary Joe that comes in and wants household loans, um, loans that will look after his personal effects. And then you have commercial loans. Uh, they look at, you know, offering loans to businesses. Then you have the backroom operations here. So the accounting and operational division. So you have an accounting and audit department. And then of course you have operations, which will consist of check clearing, posting, accounting verification and customer services. Then the fundraising, uh, you have tellers, new accounts, advertising and planning, right? Then in the trust uh, division, I'm not sure how much uh, trust functions we perform in Guyana, but typically in the US, you have uh, banks performing trust functions, right? So you have personal trust, business trust, and safekeeping department, right? So as we continue with the internal organization of the of the banking firm. So more, so larger banks, what we call money center, wholesale, and some also engage in retail business. Right. So a large money center bank is usually located in a large city, of course, as focused towards wholesale or wholesale plus retail, right? And banking services. Some of the largest banks have moved towards the profit center, the performance approach. And this approach essentially entails each major department strives to maximize its contribution to profitability or to some other performance indicator. So essentially what this approach entails is that each department will have to demonstrate uh, the viability of their existence or have to demonstrate to management that they're making a contribution to the profits of the company or to some particular uh, goal that will aid uh, the value of the company or will drive up the value of the company, right? So whether it's, even if it's not, if it's a department that doesn't generate revenue, 
then they have to demonstrate to the board that they are reducing costs, they're being efficient, something of that sort, right? Uh, the largest money center banks possess some important advantages of over community-oriented institutions. Of course, one, they have better diversity, right? So they can offer more products uh, as one avenue of diversity, but then they can also, then because they also operate in various geographic space, then that's diversity in itself, because you might expect, or, you know, um, one state, you know, maybe experiencing a, in, you know, inflationary pressures while another state might be growing, um, um, having real growth. And so as a result of that, you have um, that kind of um, diversity that ensures that the performance of the bank as a whole is not affected, right? Secondly, <clears throat> They can better withstand the risk of fluctuating economy, as I just pointed out. They should be able to raise, they are able to raise huge, huge amounts of financial capital at relatively low cost. And then finally, they can attract top management talent. Right? So those are the advantages that large wholesale banks will have, or larger wholesale banks will have over those smaller community banks. So one, they, could be, they can be better diversified, both by where they locate the banks, and the products is, they provide. And of course, <clears throat> that is tied to uh, the products they provide, it would be essentially tied to the ease in which they can re raise huge amounts of money. And I say the relative ease of which you can use, raise huge amount of money and find a financial capital. Uh, of course, if you have the better minds, then you can think of uh, products that are attractive and you can have those insights from data that you collect could really aid uh, the level of, well, not the level of service, but the, the products that you provide. And then finally, uh, because they are spread out in terms of locations, uh, they can also withstand uh, those economic pressures that, you know, where one uh, particular area might be having, might be enjoying a growth, another might not be so. So of course, if you combine them together, then you have a company as a whole that might be performing normally. Right. Then we have uh, the organizational chart for a money center wholesale bank serving domestic and international. So here you have this this bank that is serving both local and internationally. You can have the administrative services group, which will, which will, the administrative services group, which will be made up of um, senior executive management, um, the CEO, board directors. And then you have an international banking department, right? With a global finance group. Of course, you'll have the foreign offices, uh, people making up this group also. You have a fundraising department, uh, a investment funding group, a portfolio management and money market desk, an institutional banking department, capital markets department, asset liability management, planning and risk control. Right. <clears throat> then in the funds allocation division, you have commercial financial services group, commercial credit, commercial real estate, corporate services, credit and debit cards, uh, loan review group, and loan workout group. <clears throat> then you have an operations department where you have auditing and control, branch office management, computer systems, HR, tele department, securities department, regulatory compliance. Then you have personal finance services division. So you have private banking, trust services, residential lending, cons customer services, safety, Deposit department, of course, you have motor, ATM, electronic banking, then you have marketing, right? So this is what an international bank or a bank that has presence both in the domestic and international market, this is what their structure might look like these days. Trends in organization. 
So what we've seen the, in the recent year is, years is that most financial institutions become more complex over time, meaning that the way they organize, uh, there's lots of well, what they might call, you know, it, it becoming like a matrix organization. So you have different reporting lines at different levels. You might have one employee uh, or manager reporting, you know, to, to two different uh, supervisors. But you've seen, you know, that complexity in the organization. <clears throat> of course, when financial firms begin to grow, it usually adds new services and new facilities, which also makes it uh, uh, complicated, a complicated organization. Another significant factor influence, influencing financial organizations today is a changing makeup of, of the skills financial services providers need to function effectively. So with the growing line of products and the growing technology, banks continually have to <clears throat> find the necessary skills uh, to function effectively. So that is adding to some of the things that we see are happening in the bank. Right? Financial firms have needed growing number of people with computer skills. Of course, Industry 4.0 is upon us. So operating with a, with a computer or being at ease with technology is a given. What we see call centers have grown in the industry to sell profitable services and respond to customer problems. <clears throat> so in addition to those ads that we get on social media, we still have call centers and we have people making cold calls to customer to sell the products and, and services that the banks and financial institutions provide. <clears throat> Again, tied to technology, we've seen that many of the repetitive accounting and backroom staff have been automated. So what that does is take away those mundane uh, routine tasks from the operations staff and have them focus on more value added activities. So the array of organizational structure and types in the banking industry. So one we have, there, there are many types. So you have insured banks, state chartered banks. Again, just to remind you that we're um, looking at the structure of, uh, for us, for a country, US, just to then compare what we have in Indiana. So you have national banks and then you have member banks. So if we look at the U.S. commercial banks with federal versus state charters, membership in the Federal Reserve System and the deposit insurance from the federal government, of course, if you have deposit insurance with the federal government, then, you know, your depositors are protected. And uh, this is a little dated slide, but I'll ask you to bear with me. So here we have, of course, if you have an FDIC insured bank, then your depositors are protected up to, I think now, $250,000, right? So they feel that safer because if the bank should go belly up, then uh, you have government uh, backing to, to that amount, right? So you had uh, the percentage of FDIC insured bank, right? So you had 100%, uh, and there's, that was 6,839 banks. Uh, 150 banks without FDIC insurance was only 2%. Uh, then you have 1,448 1, FDIC insured bank with national federal charters. Then you had uh, 5,360 FDIC insured banks with state charters. And we went all the way down to just to give you an idea of how the banks uh, of all of those FDIC banks how much have state charter, how much have um, our members of the Federal Reserve System, and the percentage of all FDIC insured bank deposits held by National Bank. Right? Unit banking organizations. So unit banks are one of the oldest kinds and offer all the services from one office. So they will take your deposits, they will cash your checks, they will pay your bills. Um, and this may be offered for from limited service facilities such as drive up windows and automated telemachines. These organizations are still common today. 
And one of the reasons for the large number of unit banks is the continued formation of new banks. Right? So many customers still seem to prefer smaller banks which often seem to know their customer better than larger banks. Of course, they want those customers really value the relationship and they want those personal touch from their bankers. Right? And many new banks start out as unit banks. Branching organizations. So as a unit financial firm grows large in size, it usually decides at some point to establish a branching organization. Right? This offered a full range of services from head office and one or more full service branch offices. Right? And limited services via drive in windows, ATM, computer network with the, with the bank's uh, computers, point of sale terminals and stores and shopping centers. The internet and other advanced information technologies. So this is what the branch and organizations, larger than the unit organization, and they essentially try to mirror what is as much as possible what is offered by the head office. There are two levels of management, of course, the senior management of, of branching at the, at the headquarters. And though each full service branch has its own management team with limited authority to make decisions. So you might have at the branch, a particular manager might be only able to approve a loan of a certain amount. And if that loan application or that particular business transaction go past that uh, surpass that his approved approval limits then he have to go he or she has to go to head office to get the, the approval of that transaction so the branching organization so you have banking cooperation chartered by the state or federal so you have full service branch offices you have full service branch offices you have home or head office and you have full service again branch offices in the first full service branch offices, the things that you might have been offered it might include drive up window or pedestrian walk up window facilities, right? You, they sometimes offer uh, automated tele machines and their point of sale terminals in stores and shopping centers. Uh, and of course they crisscross. So you might have the home office offering all of these, but they may also offer what the full service branch offers. And in some instances, you might have the full branch office offering, having their offerings and also offering what the head office or home office may offer. Additionally, to the right here, we have the full service branch offices. They might have offer electronic communication networks. You have telephone, home, and computer service, and the internet. Branching expansion, how that occurred. So, during the depression of 1929-1930, only one in five American banks operated a full service branch office. Of course, by the beginning of the 21st century, the average, average US bank operated close to 12 full service branch office. Right? One contributing factor being the exodus of populations from cities to suburban communities. Right? And of course, the passage of the Regal Neal Interstate Bank King and Branching Efficiency Act in 1994, 1994 provided the basis for expansion. What we've seen in recent years is that new bank, new bank branch office expansion, uh, expansion appears to have slowed down somewhat. Right? So the Regal Neal Interstate Banking Efficiency Act allowed banks to follow their customer essentially. Right? So as a result of that, uh, or even before the Regal Neal Interstate Banking and, and Branching Efficiency Act, certain banks are only allowed to operate in certain states. As a result of this passing of this act, then some banks could go and open, uh, banks could then cross state lines and follow their customers, right? So many banks follow their large institutional customers so that they can, of course, provide those services to that um, customer and not lose, it, lose um, that customer's business to other competing organizations. Uh, other competing financial institutions. Right. So, as the growth of commercial uh, bank branches in the US, this gives from 1930 to 2010. Right. <clears throat> we also have electronic branching, as I mentioned earlier, e banking. So, these are websites and electronic networks and alternative, or it supplements traditional 
bank branch offices. So now, uh, in Guyana somewhat, but it's principally in the first world, you have the option of, you, you still have that option of walking into a branch, or you can decide that you want to do your banking online, right? So you have electronic branches, um, you have internet banking services, you have ATMs, you have point of sale terminals, right? So you go to the supermarket, um, you don't have to go with, with cash, you can pay those um, point of sale terminals, either cash or debit cards. Uh, you have, of course, um, you can do it using your personal computers, you can use your uh, telephones, right? Then you have call center systems, right? So if you have issues, instead of going into the bank to speak to customer service, you can call those call centers and they will, you know, handle your uh, is issue that you might have. Then, of course, you have virtual banks, which are banks that are strictly online. In the financial services industry, you have, uh, in addition to these banks, many have set up holding companies. Uh, even I think of the Ghana situation, I think the only holding company in terms of banks might be GBTI. Yeah, they have a holding company. I don't think the other banks in Ghana have a holding company. For sure, Citizen Bank doesn't have, and for sure, Demra Bank doesn't have. Um, right. So a bank holding company is simply a corporation chartered for the purposes of holding the stock of at least one bank along with other businesses. Right. Uh, the growth in holding company has been rapid in recent decades. And the principal reason for its, uh, the upsurge in its, its usage are one, access to capital markets and raising funds. Two, ability to use higher leverage, right? So they can incorporate more debt into their capital structure. Three, tax advantages. So you can combine all of these businesses together, those loss making, those, uh, those making profits, and you can carry out excellent final, uh, tax planning so that you don't have to uh, be paying out um, taxes that you don't have to. And then finally, the ability to expand into businesses outside of banking. So if you have these holding companies which hold shares in these banking, uh, in these banks, then it doesn't limit that holding company to just banking operations. They can also venture into other spaces. Right? Generally, when you're granted a banking license, you're expected to carry out banking activities. So the holding company has uh, facilitated banks venturing into other um, realms of economic activity. So just to look at the Ghana situation in terms of uh, total assets in banks as at 30th of September 2021, uh, in, in Guyana we have most of our banks here and it's September the 30th. I think Scotia, the, the figure you see here for Scotia Bank of Nova Scotia is for October 31st. Uh, yeah, and then I think all the other, and the school, and Bank of Baroda, their year end is March uh, 30th, 31st, I think. Right, their year end is in March. So as you read these figures, you should take that in mind. I haven't uh, been able to find, of course, I've been using, I'm using publicly available information. So, um, you know, I would not see the management reports, for example, for Bank of Baroda 30th of March. Right, or for Scotia Bank at 30th, sorry, for Bank of Baroda at 30th of September, or Bank of Nova Scotia for 30th of September. So, what I've used is, is publicly available information. But this is just to give you an idea of the size of the banks in terms of assets, total assets. So, if you look at all the banks in Guyana, then certainly you see Republic Bank. And these are in um, millions of Ghana dollars. So Republic Bank is the largest. And if we were to read it vertically, so they have 35% of um, total assets in the banking sector, right? Then they're followed by GBTI at 22%, uh, Demerar Bank 17, Scotia Bank and Citizen Bank just about the same, 12%, and finally Bank of Baroda. Uh, bringing up the rear at two percent. If we look at it over the years, we would have see, we would see that Republic Bank has been constant. Republic Bank and GBTI has been constant at twenty at thirty five percent and twenty two percent respectively. And so much and so has been Bank of Baroda. 
So the movement that we've seen uh, over the years is Demerara Bank growing from 15% in 2018 to 17%, and uh, Citizen Bank growing from 10% to 12% in 2000, in, from 10% in 2018 to 12% in 2021. Scotia Bank is the one who's been losing uh, uh, market share over the last four years. So they've gone from 16 to 12%. No doubt that might be an indication or it might be as a result of their efforts being more focused on uh, selling this particular branch in Guyana, right? So they might not have been approaching the business as they used to do in, in, in many years. But it's important to note, so imagine if uh, Republic Bank was successful in obtaining or buying over Nova Scotia. Then you had one competitor, an already strong competitor in the market, moving from 35% to just about 4 to 7% of total assets. So Republic Bank would have been, become a really dominant player in the market. And as a result of that, uh, you know, it would certainly have, um, have an impact on the banking industry in the uh, in Guyana, right? If we look at it horizontally, so we're looking at year upon year growth. So we see, uh, we see, for example, in 2019, Bank of Baroda had uh, a negative growth, right? So they moved from 12 billion to 10 billion. Uh, but then in 2020, they grew, right? So they moved from 10 billion to 13 billion, and then they had another 9% growth in 2021. Scotia Bank, uh, you know, negative growth in 2019, significant growth of 16% in 2020, but then they had a decline of 3%. Citizen Bank have been growing, um, enjoying good growth, so 9% in 2019, 16% in 2020, 30% in 2021, right? So the asset base is certainly growing. Uh, the same for Demerara Bank been growing rapidly, 18%, 8%, 12%, 37% uh, from the asset base. GBTI also been growing, and so is Republic Bank from an asset, from a total asset perspective. In terms of the, the deposits that these banks hold, so all the deposits of banks, both commercial and um, household. Republic Bank holds 36% of all deposits, 22% uh, GBTI, Demerara Bank has 16%, uh, Citizen Bank 12%, Bank of Nova Scotia 11%. And you can see both Republic Bank and GBTI has been constant over the years um, with their 36 and 22% holding of total deposits. Bank of Baroda just 2%, they've been constant. Uh, Scotia Bank has been declining. Citizen Bank have been growing, um, right? Albeit, you know, just one percent to one percent per year. And then you have uh, the, the picture being quite similar for Demerara Bank, right? Uh, that's vertically. If we look horizontally, then you see in terms of deposits, uh, Citizen Bank over the last financial year saw their deposits grow, thirty-five percent. Demerara Bank. 24%, GBTI 15%, and 16% for uh, Republic Bank. And you're, you also see Bank of Baroda there growing too in terms of deposits, uh, which might signal, which might signal, of course, there are many Indian companies in Guyana these days, and they tend to go to Bank of Baroda uh, because, of course, Bank of Baroda is an Indian bank, um, and it's also a, multi, a bank that has presence in many jurisdictions over the years. It's only in Guyana that it's, it's, it's a little, well, not only in Guyana, but certainly in Guyana, it's, um, you, it doesn't have the prominence that it once had a few years ago, but you go to a lot of the Midwest states in the US, you will see Bank of Baroda very much there. Um, in Asia, Bank of Baroda very much there, right? So I might think, I would think that you, you would like see in, uh, certainly growth in Bank of Baroda, especially as you have lots of, um, well, some Indian companies winning very large uh, construction and infrastructure contracts in Guyana. 
And of course, as India and Ghana continue to build those bilateral relationships, you will see more economic activity. And it's my prediction that, you know, they will go to, um, like most other countries do, if they uh, go to a country and they have, you know, one of their local banks have a presence there, they tend to support that, right, which is all good and fine. But you certainly see as a whole, as a whole, uh, the whole, the deposits grew by 16%, right? So we have 16% more money being put in the bank and not being loaned out, right? In terms of, um, well, I should correct that from the previous statement. It should be 16%, just, just leave it to 16% growth in those deposits. In the Guyana speed, in the, on the loan side, we have, Again, we present the figures for the banks and we show you 2018 to 2021, right? So we can see in terms of loans over the last financial year, uh, sorry, in terms of the number of loans or the percentage of loans outstanding. Again, you have Republic Bank at 32%, you have GBTI at 18%, Demerara Bank 17%, right? Uh, so despite the Mara Bank being significantly smaller, have a smaller asset base, they the amount of loans they've made is 17%, almost on par with uh, GBTI, which has a large asset base. So in, in actuality, you can say that the Mara Bank is being very aggressive, right? Uh, Scotia Bank, of course, I suspect these are many old loans uh, that they would have had. Yes, very old loans, because if you look at horizontally, they've maintained their 18%. They continue to decline, uh, but their loan portfolios, loan advances portfolio only grow by 1% um, over the, the last financial year. Citizen Bank, uh, they're at 12%, and then you have Bank of Aroda at 2%. <clears throat> um, in terms of growth to year upon year, you see Bank of Baroda, they grew by 26%, right? So their loan port, loan and advances portfolio have certainly grown, uh, are grown the most over the, the last um, year. Demerara Bank being very aggressive, they grew by 23%. So when they had only a 2% growth in 2020, right? Uh, of course, 2020 was a year of us waiting for uh, an election results for many year, uh, many months. You would think that a lot of uh, a lot of the banks, and you see it here, right? A lot of the banks might have been skeptical, don't know what to do. Well, essentially, they don't know what to do, but just to wait and see what plays out before they actually make made any decisions. But you will see that almost all the banks in the next year became very, um, I mean, had lots of activities, right? So you had. Uh, Bank of Baroda moving from 3% in 2020 to 26%, you know, growth in their loan portfolio. Uh, Republic GBTI 8% to 21%, uh, Demerara Bank 2% to 23% growth. So these um, these banks all, you know, in 2021 really expanded uh, and, and, and really, and it's remarkable for Demerara Bank for, to be uh, as small as it is, maybe as half the size of GBTI, but they have a loan portfolio that is as large as GBTI, right? Which is which is remarkable. And you know, uh, 2022 it might be interesting when we update this table to see what really has happened since then. Good. As we continue, uh, in terms of organization structures and types in the banking industry, it says most registered bank. Holding companies in the U.S. are one bank companies. However, these one bank companies frequently control one or more non-bank businesses as well, right? So it's providing, of course, um, those holding companies are able to venture into other economic spaces and also push on and provide that diversity that the banking, banking industry needs. Then you have the principal advantage of for holding companies entering non-bank lines of business is a prospect of, as I mentioned, diversifying resources of diversifying sources of revenue and profits and reducing risk exposure. And it says a minority of bank holding company organizations are multi-bank holding companies. So multi-bank companies control more than 70% of total assets of all U.S. banking organizations. 
So it's one dramatic effect of holding company expansion has been a sharp decline in the number of independently owned banking organizations and banks acquired by holding companies are referred to as affiliated banks. Banks not owned by holding companies are known as independent banks. So here are some most interesting non-bank uh, financially related businesses that registered holding companies can acquire on the U.S. banking regulations here. So the most important non-bank financially related businesses that are registered holding companies can acquire on the U.S. banking services. So you can acquire finance companies, they lend funds to businesses and households. You can, you can have mortgage companies which provide short-term credit to improve real real property for residential or commercial use, data processing companies, factoring companies. Factoring companies purchase accounts receivables from businesses in exchange for supplying temporary financing. So a factoring company may go to a bank and say, let me take your, uh, the receivables that you have, but you, I'll give you 95% of the total value. So what it does for that bank, it provides the, uh, the financing, right? So their receivables are wiped off the books and then that factoring company is responsible now oh, well that factoring company has bought over those receivables and it's the factoring company's responsibility to follow up and ensure payment then you have security brokerage for brokerage firms and they essentially execute customer buy and sell orders for securities for an exchange futures and options contract right so you so people may uh in both individuals and companies can place orders to buy or sell a stock and the brokerage rich company will uh, make that deal once those re uh, requested stocks become available. Right? Then you have financial advising and they advise institutions and high net worth individuals on managing assets on mergers, reorganization of their business or raising capital and they also do feasibility studies. Then you have credit insurance on the writers, right? So they supply insurance coverage to customers borrowing money to guarantee the repayment of loans. <clears throat> um, they do merchant banking, uh, which is essentially invest in corporate stocks as well as loan money to help finance the start of new ventures or to support the expansion of existing businesses. Merchant banking banks do not accept deposits. Then you have investment banking firms. They purchase new government and municipal bonds and corporate stocks and bonds from issuers and offer these securities to buyers. Then you have trust companies. They manage and care for the property of businesses, individuals, and non-profit organizations. You have credit card companies, leasing companies. Leasing companies play an important role in the finance and uh, financing of businesses in, in that they will purchase the those uh, equipment that is needed, capital equipment that is needed, and then they release it to those companies. So what it does, it, re it uh, reduces the capital outlay that those companies may require to execute large projects, right? Because the leasing company is the company that would have, would have acquired those um, assets and then will then rent it to them or lease it to them. Then you have insurance companies and agencies uh real estate services and then you have savings associations so multi-bank holding company right so you will have affiliated non-bank service you can have affiliated bank you can have another affiliated bank and another affiliated bank but this just gives you an idea of the structure of a multi-bank holding company So holding company banking has been blamed for reducing competition by critics. Of course, if you become a holding uh, a holding company and you acquire all these banks, of course, the concentration becomes the concentration of those businesses becomes um, uh, denser. So as a result of that, the competition in the market reduces. Right? However, the supporters of holding company movement claim great efficiency. So they're saying, look. If we can merge these, acquire these bank or have these or have these mergers, then we will drive efficiency. We will gain efficiency through these synergies. So as a result of these efficiencies, then we can provide our services to you at a lower cost. We can also provide more services to you, right? Uh, we could have lower probability of organizational failure, 
because of course some research will demonstrate that if you reach an optimal size the chances of you failing becomes very small right and you can also be, you have higher and more stable profits right because of a reducing competition of course um, the profits can be higher and they could be more predictable and stable the holding company as a whole tends to be more profitable than banking organizations that do not form holding companies Says moreover, the failure rate for holding company banks appears to be to be below that of comparable size independent banks. So of course the the argument that they use seems to have some weight, uh, uh, because the empirical results demonstrate that holding banks um, uh, withstand uh, more shocks than independent banks. Right. However, they're saying that the evidence is anecdotal and that multi-bank holding companies may drain scarce capital from some communities and weaken smaller towns and rural areas. Right. So the Regal and Neal uh, Act allows holding companies to acquire banks throughout the US without needing any state permission to do so and establish branch offices across state lines, right? So they can follow the customer, they can be, uh, they can set up shop wherever they wish. So why did the federal government eventually enact and the state support the interstate banking laws? So one, the need to bring new capital to revive surviving local economies, the expansion of financial services offerings by non-bank financial institutions that face new restrictions on their ability to expand nationwide, a strong design on the part of the largest financial firms to geographically diverse, diversify their operations and open new marketing opportunities. The belief among regulators that large financial firms will be more efficient and less prone to failure, or prone to failure. Advances in the technology of financial services delivery, permitting service to customers of a broader geographic area. So that's why uh, the act was past and states supported the bank uh, laws. So an alternative type of banking organization available as the 21st century opens is the financial and holding companies. But this was under the terms of the Graham Leach and Billy Act. Financial holding companies are defined as a special type of holding company that may offer the broadest range of financial services, including dealing in and underwriting securities and selling and underwriting insurance. Right? With the financial holding companies, each affiliated firm has its own capital management, profit or losses separate from the profit and losses of other affiliates of the financial holding companies. And of course, some protection against company-wide losses. This led to consolidation and convergence within the industry. So while we had the act of 1930 separating what banks could have done, uh, so you have a bank should not be involved in underwriting securities or, bank, so, or providing insurance services. What this uh, Graham, what this act did was to ensure that it, come, it came back again, again, right? So you have a financial services, um, financial services holding company. They you have possible affiliated firms, possible affiliated firms. You have insurance agencies, commercial banking, security purchases and sales, merchant banking, real estate development and travel agencies. So that latest act brought back all of those services on the one house. So of course, what it did was to reverse, you know, uh, the separation, which the 1930 act. gave or that 19 act, 1930 act delivered. So that the premise of that 1930 act was to ensure that, uh, you know, that the risk, all the risk wasn't contained in one house and that they were separated. But this latest act here uh, by Graham and Dilly and Leach, they brought everything together again. And this must have been a precursor to what happened 19, in 2007, 2008, where you had companies, um, you know, offering these full range of services and that risk really remaining in one company, right? 
But mergers and acquisitions are reshaping the structure and organization of the financial services sector. So what we're seeing, the rise of branching, bank holding companies and financial holding companies by, has been fueled by multiple factors. Right, so there's another powerful factor spurring these organizational types forward is their ability to carry out mergers and acquisitions. Bigger companies have pursued smaller financial services providers and purchased their assets in great numbers. Since 1980, more than 12,000 bank mergers have occurred in the U.S. In Guyana, we haven't seen any bank mergers going on. Uh, Banking principal competitors, credit unions, savings association, finance companies, insurance firms, security dealers, hedge funds, and other financial uh, firms. So those are the principal uh, competitors of the banks, and all are affected by powerful sources such as rising operational costs and rapidly changing technology. A notable ex exception until very recently has been hedge funds. All financial firms are starting to look alike, especially in the menu of services offered. So this is what we call convergence, right? Because they're all uh, competing in the same markets, the same spaces, because of the services they offer now. Since great structural and organizational changes have spilled over into one financial services industry after another, right? So you've had these spillover effects uh, from one financial service industry to another. So you might have the insurance company, um, you know, offering a particular product only for the banks to copy it uh, a little after. The efficiency and size, so do bigger financial firms operate at lower costs? Right. So what does the empirical evidence say? It says, if not, then why have some financial institutions become some of the largest businesses on the planet. So two possible sources of cost savings. So you have economies of scale and you have economies of scope. So we can offer the lowest, uh, the lowest uh, possible cost, economies of scale, and we can offer the widest array, uh, array of services, economies of scope. This so for finance for financial firms. There is evidence for at least moderate economies of scale in banking, though most studies find only weak evidence or none for economies of scope. So studies of selected non-bank financial firms often reach conclusion that roughly parallel the results of the banking industry. And financial firms' goals, you know, impact on operating cost, efficiency, and performance. So we have expense preference behavior. That's when the management of a financial firm decides that benefits for managers um, and not the stakeholders or the public should be the primary objective of the company. So again, this is a manifestation of agency costs and the opposite of control and cost efficiency. So instead of controlling cost and efficiency, they become to um, splurge on themselves, their offices, um, you know, really rack up those costs and really forget about the efficiency aspect. Then you have agency theory, it analyzes relationships between a firm's uh, owners, stockholders, and its managers who are legally, who legally are agents for the owners. It explores whether mechanisms exist in each situation to compel managers to maximize the welfare of the company, right? So in terms of putting things in line, so this speaks a lot about the governance uh, structures and mechanisms that are in place in those companies. How do they ensure that the managers are acting in the best interest of the owners? And then you have low agency costs and better company performance depend on the effectiveness of these corporate governance structures and mechanisms. And that's all I have for you. Uh, sorry that I'm missing uh, today's lecture in uh, be able to deliver it to you. Uh, but I trust that you would listen to the recordings and uh, let's meet up again next week to continue our class, which has been very enjoyable thus far.